Welcome to today this latest edition of Lexington Remembers. You can see the uh, logo behind us here. Uh, I'm I'm very happy that uh, the guest for this program is Sat Oishi, uh, who lives here in Lexington and has a fascinating story to tell us. And Sat, when did you come to Lexington? It came about uh, 10 years ago. And the reason we came is because my daughter lives in uh, the next town. What is it? Belmont. Belmont. And, uh, and we have one uh, grandson. And uh, we used to visit each other about every three months. And we had a couple of accidents on the road. So we said we have to get closer together. So we have been, we had had been looking at, at uh, you know, places where we could, we could uh, change our our living place. And uh, and what happened was, in in the course of probably a year, we looked at a dozen uh, places and the it happened that on a Sunday, nice sunny Sunday, the uh, person who owned the condo that we now live in, he was looking for a buyer and the sun was coming through the the uh, windows, and it was lovely. And I said to my family, and he told us how much he was uh, wanted to get for for the unit. And I said, uh, and we owned the house in uh, Summit, New Jersey, that we owned for almost fifty years. And it was about the same price that we would sell it for. So I looked at the faces on my uh, family, and I said, let's go for it. I don't think we're going to find anything better. And that's how, we, that's how we got. That's how you and your late wife found the place that you now yeah. live in. Yeah. Okay, and it's re really close to your daughter and your yes, yeah. son-in-law and your grandson. Yeah, ten minutes away. We yeah. we see each other at least a couple of times a week, and so that sure beats Summit, New Jersey. It, it sure does. <laughs> <laughs> and and what what were you doing in Summit, New Jersey? Summit, New Jersey. Good question. I graduated from the University of Connecticut in 1949, and uh, I, uh, with two of my roommates, we got an apartment in uh, really in East Harlem, New York, to look for jobs and so on. And you, you graduated in what program? Uh, in engineering, civil in engineering, en yeah, okay. civil engineering, and and uh, we were familiar with the the uh, the uh, the the head of the engineering school was a person named Castleman, who was well known throughout bridge engineers. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. So, so we uh, uh, knew that much, and we uh, we were also directed to uh, a couple of known uh, people who look for jobs for new graduates. Oh, okay. And. Uh, 
And when it was happening, the New Jersey Turnpike was under construction or it was starting. Oh, that thing. They were looking for, you know, good graduates. I bet. Uh, and so that's how I got in there. And that that uh, company that uh, I was hired uh, was uh, headed, it was called Edwards and Kelsey. And Mr. Edwards was a graduate of Harvard. Oh, okay. Very kind, very thoughtful person. And between the two of them, they were, they, they, uh, they set up some of the, some of the, the, uh, Way in which we design and and um, manipulate traffic on highways. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. and and um, as they I, were traffic engineers. They were traffic. They started. They were one of them was one of the starters of. Mm -hmm. He's the first one who counted traffic by lanes. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. and he also uh, designed uh, circular intersections. And in the winter, he would he would pile the snow in, into such shapes and and see how they worked. Really? <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. So so uh, they were very. Uh, and their chief engineer, he was older than both of them, and he was also a graduate of Harvard. And uh, his name was Hanavan. He lived in Manhattan, and uh, he was he was also very very kind. I would say he wasn't a brilliant engineer, but he was you know uh, one of the first. Uh, first steps that uh, they uh, uh, created because they had a lot of new graduates was to create a school of associates. Oh, I've seen. Yeah. Of new graduates. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and among those new graduates, I was one to uh, be given nice projects and in those days the the re reaction of the client was key if you know you work well with clients and mm -hmm. they they got uh, uh, good uh, reports back to the firm you know that was that was a reason for promotions Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so. Uh, but but you had quite a pathway to that first job. Yeah. Um, March of this year had special meaning for you. Yes. Seventy-five years ago. What tell us what happened uh, yeah, well, to you and your family uh, seventy-five well, years ago? Seventy-five years ago, our good president FDR uh, issued a, a a presidential proclamation seven zero. Zero nine or z zero nine nine. That's being celebrated in Washington right now. And what it did was it gave the army total total um, authority to get all the Japanese out of Washington, Oregon, and California. Just those three states. Just those three states. And uh, so the army, the, the, that section was 
headed by a general named DeWitt. And the fact is the prejudice against Japanese farmers and whatever was rampant anyway. So they said, yeah, get him out of here. And now, what what was the basis for the for the uh, prejudice? Why were they? They they were they looked the same as the enemy. Okay. Uh, yeah, All right. we, we were Japanese. Did, was it, was it anything to do with the with the economics? What the the Japanese farming or Japanese fishing or anything? Uh, I I don't. I don't think so because there were very few fishermen. They were the others were Portuguese, and uh, it was not an economic thing, but it was in general there was a lot of prejudice against Japanese. Mm -hmm. So you know the 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 uh, both both the people and the and the uh, uh, the people in state governments and federal governments said yes let's get them out and uh, and the it, part of it goes back way back to uh, something like 1906, the first Japanese to l land in this country in California applied for naturalization. The naturalization law at that time was written, of course, by the small eight states on the east coast of North America, and the the uh, law uh, stated that those are uh, those who are eligible for for um, uh, naturalization are Europeans and Africans, but not Asians. Well, yeah, the Asians were they weren't even visible. Yeah. Yeah. So that that rule that rule became a key for many many laws in the three states. Those you can be a, a, a license to do such and such, let's say, except for those ineligible for citizenship, and that that statement was used to keep Japanese out of certain sir, sir, professions. Yeah, yeah. So this would have been March of 1942. Yes, exactly. The war started December 7th, yeah. uh, 1941. So about three months later. Yes. And how old were you, Seth? I was 13. You were 13. I was 13, and the, the, also the federal government had passed a uh, law that all aliens 13 and over had to register. So I registered. That was no problem. But then I had to help my father and my mother register they they didn't speak english very well i became a i became a a a uh, translator translator from there on yeah all the way but uh, we also my father and i said you know this is this this is this is the kind of thing that the country this country will make good will now now you had brothers and sisters at the time it was your mother and father and you were 13 yes and that's that do you have a brothers and you no know, i was the oldest you were the uh, oldest i was the oldest yeah yes and uh and we the 
one of the first steps, well, they put us into camps. Well, tell me first, now, how did you find out about this? In the paper. You were living there, and, and you were living there in Los Angeles. Yes. Right. And you had a house. and a Yeah, yeah. We, we rented a house. We rented a half of a house. And uh, we, uh, through the papers, the notices. Was in the newspaper. Uh, newspapers. And, and uh, the, they would uh, not only tell the time when you were going to be picked up, but where. And and I had a gasoline, shell gasoline uh, map, and I used to color the areas that was getting close to us. Okay. And uh, and 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 so the newspaper said that you were supposed to be at a certain place. At a certain time. Yes, with with uh, with one bag. One bag. One bag. That's it. But what about all the things in your house? Uh, well, everyone had to do things their own way. But our neighbor, who happened to be Jewish, they said you could put some of your furniture in our basement, and you could you know, pay a rent for it, you know, it's a modest amount. Mm -hmm. And the, the modest amount and what uh, came and re, uh, came after the war was a Frigidaire refrigerator. Oh. Uh, yeah, we got it shipped back to Connecticut. By the time we were, that was they'd stored it in there. Yeah, basement. That, and yeah. and what was it your father was doing at the time? Oh, he he was uh, at that time, he was managing a Chinese restaurant for, that was owned by his one of his relatives in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, I see, in Japantown. I see. And he was he was he was an unusual Japanese in that he was six feet tall. Really? Yeah, he was a handsome man, <laughs> and and uh, he went to school to be a teacher, and uh, he uh, he was a uh, uh, not only a teacher but a teacher of aquatics fishing and oh really uh, yeah and and but he couldn't practice that so he we uh he couldn't teach or he couldn't fish no but he couldn't do either and we were uh, uh, uh live with relatives who had a farm in gardena and there were several uh, families like that who had uh, got got to this country early and bought land and started farms. So we lived with them for a while, and then we moved to Los Angeles. Now, when did you when did your parents come over from Japan? Well, my father. Um, came I think in 1919 okay and uh, the uh, although Orientals were excluded those who were involved in what they called treaty trades in other words, uh, business that uh, involved arts and crafts, that uh, was traded f with Japan and then sold to. Ah, uh, I see. And uh, and we, my father, he had to go once a year and pay the owner of such a store 
so that he would qualify as a treaty trader. Uh -huh. And that's how we came. We were son and, and, and uh, a wife of a treaty trader. Okay. Yeah, that, that, was, that was one, one way. And, and then they stuck us into the first place they stuck us was in the stables at Santa Anita Racetrack. When they picked you up, now they picked you up in a bus in a street corner. Yeah, somewhere? exactly. With a suitcase uh, apiece. Uh, yeah. And and then, then, how much notice did they give you? Oh, it couldn't have been. I don't. I don't remember, but it couldn't have been more than a couple of weeks. I see. Okay, yeah. so you saw in the paper. Yeah. That you were going to be removed, yes. And <clears throat> so then they picked you up in the bus, and where did they take you that first day? The first step was to the uh, San Anita racetrack, big, big racetrack with with. Uh, uh, oh, what uh, places for the horses? Yeah, stables. Stables, and we were in one of them. They gave us five cots, and the upper part was open, so yeah. our neighbors uh, we could hear them talking. <laughs> and 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 this, how did the army treat you when they put you on the bus and then? The, dropped you off the, at the, the army treated us you know okay yeah they, they were uh, perfectly uh, and were the people standing around on the street corner yes watching you get picked up i i guess so i don't recall yeah looking at the people but yes we we were that was a temporary stopover the san anita race yeah we were there for from uh, from March till September or something like that. And then, oh, that long? Yeah, that in that place. Six they, months. Yeah, but then they brought they took us by train to one of the eleven camps. These are the more permanent camps, and a a uh, uh, a new organization was created, and it was called the War Relocation Authority, and it was all managed by Quakers. Oh, yeah. They put the Quakers in charge of this yeah, yeah. agency uh, and in yeah. charge of the camps. Yeah, yeah, and and. The camps were, they were first class in that we had teachers that were first class. We had health workers who were first class. There, we uh, attended a 60-year anniversary of these camps, and we... For, for the first time, we had uh, 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 what should we call it? The conversations with the local people, the local Arkansas, because our camp was the one in Rower, Arkansas, on the Mississippi uh, uh, floodplain, and they envied us because we had first class schools, first class teachers, first class hospital, and they wondered first they thought we were we were uh, uh, soldiers uh, prisoners of war. Yeah, prisoners of war. And then they saw that we came with children. Yeah. And then, lo and behold, they had, we had first-class teachers, 
They were recruited from all over the world, I mean, all over the country. And of course, they were paid uh, higher than where they taught in Indiana or some places mm -hmm. like that. And, and uh, it was... Uh, it was a first-class organization. Club Med, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, what was the what were the living quarters like? Were they there? Once we got to the camps, we still had only cots. Really? Yeah, we only had a cot, and we had a wood-burning stove. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, my father, the camp was divided into about 48 blocks. Each block contained a mess hall. Oh, and, uh, okay. And, you know, bathrooms and so on. And, uh, and the... But the rooms were a little bit bigger, and uh, we uh, we could not be paid more than the we were paying the American soldiers in the army. So we were getting twelve, fourteen dollars a month. Yeah, that's privates pay. Yeah, uh, and and what. What did your parents do? Your father was running the restaurant, was he, working in the restaurant in yeah, Los Angeles. He, what did he do in the camp? He he was he was the block manager of uh, of our block of. What? So he got paid for that. Yes, he got paid for that, and I would go out, and um, we were we were on the edge. Of a forest, the the uh, government had uh, leased uh, something like a thousand acres all around, mostly uh, forests. And in order to keep warm, we had we had to go out and be lumberjacks. And yeah. fortunately, there were enough people who knew how to do that and. I used to go out on weekends and get paid twelve dollars a month. <laughs> oh, to pick up wood. <laughs> okay. Now, could you leave the camp? No. You had to stay with them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And and uh, how how many people were in this camp in Arkansas? Uh, the one in Arkansas, I think. I think uh, I have the data, but uh, I would say. Ten thousand. Wow. Right. Yeah. So. And newspapers, radio, everything, everything came, and and uh, you know one of the things that uh, happened was the young young men volunteered, and they created the the. Uh, uh, hundredth, uh, what I forgot what they called them, but they were a special group in the army, and they were they got more, more uh, citations than any group in the army, and uh, you know they, that they were sent to Europe. Oh, they were. Yeah, yeah. Uh. And and so a lot of a lot of the younger men uh, volunteered to yes, yes, serve. They did. they did. It it was it was better than rolling around in the camp. Well, I would think. Yeah. You know, but for those of us who were high school and younger, we we had a ball. Where yeah. we really didn't have parental uh, control over us, and yeah. you know, we uh, 
I should have brought the the annual booklet that we made. It has to be done all by hand. Yeah. And, you know, stuff like that. And we set our own hours. You uh, did, huh? Yeah. yeah. Well, what did your parents think about that? Uh, they, they couldn't do much. <laughs> they couldn't do much. <laughs> they couldn't? <laughs> no. Why? Uh, because there, there's no control. <laughs> because mean, the uh, camp people were in control. Uh, yeah. Is that right? Well, they were all our people. Oh, uh, I camp, see. Camp people. The camp people were our people. Yeah. There, there was no... They had watchtowers, but they were seldom, you know, seldom manned. Really? Yeah. And Did they have barbed wire around? They had barbed wire, but we could go out into the woods. Oh, really? Did, yeah. So you could get, you weren't supposed to, but you could get off the campground. Yeah, the campground, yes. Yeah. And did anybody run away? Did anybody uh, escape? No. no. They, where would they go? No. They They'd couldn't. get caught awfully fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so so this this organization then it's uh headed by Quakers but its objective was to get as many people out of camps outside working as many as possible. And that's how my father and I uh people could uh employers could come in and uh, sign up uh, workers. And one of the big workers to be, uh, one group to be signed up was by Bird's Eye. Oh, Don, really? Don, the food? Uh, yeah. Don, I remember them. They first, he started frozen food. Yes, yes. And so he had a plant there in yeah, Arkansas. Yeah, and he, there's still uh, remnants of, you know, the Japanese uh, culture that they left down there in South Jersey. Really? Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. So, so the employers would come into the camp and hire exactly people to work in the yeah. Plants, uh, yeah, or whatever. We got uh, hired by a restaurateur. Who okay. Owned a restaurant. It's really a diner in uh, Waterbury, Connecticut. That's how. Now wait a minute. Wait, this is after you left the camp. No, this is now. We were we were in the. Uh, we were in the the. The uh, first camp, the first, um, oh, what should we call it? The uh, in Arkansas, uh, the Arkansas uh, camp. Uh, oh, the Arkansas camp. Yeah. We, so, well, how did you end up in Waterbury? Well, we it's was, a long way from Arkansas. We we were hired by a, a guy who owned. A restaurant in Waterbury, Connecticut. Well, now I'm confused. Is this after the war was over? Uh, or when the war was still on? It was... Gee, it would, it would have been... Uh, I would have been... Uh, I don't know, 13, 14, 14, something like that. So. You said you were 13 when you went into the camp. camp. And, into the. F and, and so, so somebody from Waterbury, Connecticut, who ran a restaurant, came to the camp. Yes. And hired people. Yes. And so then you could leave. You left the camp. Yes, we got. We were given twenty-five dollars and train fare to Waterbury from Arkansas. 
so the the only so you could go if you got hired from the camp. Yes. You could go any place in the country yeah. where you were hired. Except for the Except West Coast. Except for the West Coast. Yeah. Right. Lot so many settled in Chicago, for example, got jobs in Chicago and in some in Philadelphia, but a few scattered here and there. And uh, we were we were hired by this owner of a really call it a diner, and he was Japanese. Ah, and okay. he he was a Japanese who skipped off of the ship in New York. He came. There were there were a handful of Japanese in the in in uh, New York City that had businesses who were who were jumped off the ship. They were illegal immigrants. I see. So then he set up a restaurant. Yeah. And and so did you stay in the camp in school or did you go to Waterbury? I went to Waterbury. I'm, How long were you in the camp in Arkansas then? In Arkansas, I was, uh, well, we were uh, from Santa Anita Racetrack. We were sent to Arkansas, the camp in Arkansas, and we were there. I was there for, I don't know, two years. Okay, before you went to Waterbury. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. So, well, <clears throat> so how how did you feel about suddenly being pulled out of your home and your yeah. school and everything and stuck well, in a well, camp yeah. in Arkansas? Yeah, well, that's we had no no choice. Yeah, absolutely no choice. And in this in this. A Japanese-owned restaurant in uh, Waterbury. The it was manned. All the workers were Japanese. In the kitchen, my father worked in the kitchen, and we had eight people working in the diner. In the and the. Uh, the the wife of the owner was the cashier, and she used to brag that we had three valedictorians waiting, working as waiters in this restaurant. Yeah, really. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Uh, and and so you had a house in Waterbury. And well, we uh, we rented a, a house. F uh, from the cities, one of the city oh, housing, oh, I see. For, and uh, we got, got, had a nice apartment. And and once we got that, we got my f mother and and sisters to come out from from Arkansas. From Arkansas, so so that that's how they settled in Waterbury. So you had how, how many sisters did you have? I had, uh, at that point, I think I had two sisters. Yeah, you yeah. and two sisters. Yeah. You were the oldest one. I was the oldest one. So were you hired by the diner, too? Yes. At 13? Yeah. Oh, well, for, you've been 15 uh, by 15, now. 15, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And, and he, so all of a sudden, you're, you're settled in water. How would you feel about it? Being out of the camps, yeah, it felt good. We were paid a hundred dollars a month. We were given bed bedroom, and uh, but we had and of course my goal was to get into a university. Yeah, but there I had nobody to talk to who could. Help me, and it's when, that's when the Quakers 
set up in Philadelphia what they called war war relocation authority or something like that and they helped uh, first they helped the students who had already been in college at the University of California or wherever and were pulled out to, they helped them find schools the even at that point the government would not uh, allow us to go to any school. They, yeah, the gov government, you know, they wouldn't let us apply. Not that we could afford it, Yale or, or. Isn't that? I wonder why. That's strange. Yeah. So, so there you were, and you're ready for college. You're in, yeah. Graduated from high school. Yeah. You want to go to college, yeah. and the Quakers helped yeah. find a college yeah. Yes. for you. Yeah, University of Connecticut, and and I was, I discovered that I I had been a resident of Connecticut for over six months, which made me a legal resident, so that I could that uh, tuition at the University of Connecticut was something like $125. It must have been a semester. Yeah. Yeah, and... <laughs> I didn't drink my dog. <laughs> so... Well, it was $400 a year at Harvard when I went there, uh, yeah. so <laughs> the same... Yeah. Same kind of thing. Yeah, it, it was. People yeah. can't believe that now. <laughs> That's right. And the beauty beauty was when I worked summers at a summer resort, I could make enough to 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 uh, work, to uh, go to school for the coming year. Yeah. 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 It's, and uh, what were your sisters up to at this point? Well, they were they were in grammar school. Okay, in yeah. Waterbury. Waterbury, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the the camps are behind you now. Yes, right. And yeah. and what about uh, what what happened to the people who are left in Arkansas? Well, they slowly, slowly uh, left. They found jobs, and and I think, you know, I don't know what else they did, but uh, they didn't uh, stay in camp. There was yeah, around the country. So, you know, it's, it's so weird, Sad, because if you were going to, if this group of people, this, this Japanese people, were going to do sabotage or something. <laughs> I mean, you were only going to be saboteurs on the West Coast? <laughs> you weren't going to do anything in Waterbury? <laughs> I mean, the, the whole thing is is weird. It's weird. Well, that's true. But uh, the, as I said, the, the wife of the uh, owner was the cashier. And she used to brag that uh, as waiters, there were three uh, valedictorians. <laughs> and she would tell everybody, when I was accepted into uh, University got... of Connecticut, now we used to get a lot of customers coming in. I asked where stores was to the customers. Where stores Connecticut? Yeah, they didn't know. They, they didn't, didn't know, know and you didn't, didn't know. know. <laughs> and I didn't know. So the finally a union uh, union leader said, I know what that is. That's the Stores Agricultural College. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's what it used to be called. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, it was a as they said, an agricultural college. It was a uh, what do they call it a a, a um, 
funded partly by the U.S. government. Yeah, uh, under the Morrill Act. Uh, yeah, and uh, and what? Uh, and then that emerged into the University of Connecticut. Yes, that happened in yes, yes. all the states. I think at uh, the same. And uh, I got in. I got in on uh, Feb February or January entry to replace about 40 students who had either left for one reason or another, and we were accepted into there. No one knew how to travel to Yukon. Yeah. yeah I found one person, and he, he was a... Uh, he was a Greek <laughs> native, and I hung on to him, and he, we uh, took the bus to Willimantic, the, the, and, and then the last eight miles, we hitchhiked. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. We, we hitchhiked to a school, and... Um, in, in at the University of Connecticut, there were already about eight or ten uh, Japanese Americans mm -hmm. as students there, and they they uh, uh, put me in a, a dormitory with one of them, mm -hmm. and uh, and and uh, from then on, everyone at the university was kind and thoughtful to us. I mean, I, I couldn't say uh, I have a, I have a, uh, a interview that I gave to the, the university uh, alumni recently and, you know, and, and I, Tell them that they, in general, they were all very kind and thoughtful to us. Yeah, that's good. And yeah. this, and the war is still, well, the war over by this time. When you went to to stores, was the war over? When I went to store, it was I, I graduated in forty nine. You went in forty five then. Yeah. 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 So it was over in August of forty five. Yeah. 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 Well, One of the funny. Uh, well, not funny. My uncle, who. Uh, had been a graduate of Berkeley before the war started. He, um, and he was one of these happy guys, hey, I can fix that kind of guy. And he got stuck among the first uh, group of, of Japanese seniors who were stuck into camps. And these were all people who had served in the Japanese army in oh. some, you know, in some way or another. Yeah. And he said, oh, I'll get him out. I mean, he was that kind of guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course, he didn't. But as soon as he got into this camp, this was a special camp, he saw that, as he puts it, he could be of great service by staying there to be a translator yeah. because he was fluent in both Japanese and English. Mm -hmm. And and when uh, the war ended, he was given an opportunity to go to Japan. <coughs> <coughs> he was a citizen. Yeah. Of Japan. So he went to Japan, and being the outspoken, out... Uh, extrovert. Extrovert. He uh, married 
a lady who owned a hotel in Tokyo. And lo and behold, the election in the United States let uh, Harry Truman beat uh, oh, Dewey. Dewey. And he volunteered to be the interpreter to, to for Dewey. Oh, really? <laughs> so he really? sent the newspaper with him, you know, you see, explaining to Dewey what he was seeing. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. So um, this is really a dark chapter in American history. Uh, you can't help wondering whether Franklin Roosevelt ever realized what he'd done and how, mm. how what an un-American thing it was that, yeah. that he did. And, and the hardship on all those yes. families and they, they lost, when they left, they lost everything. Yes. Except yeah. what was in the suitcase. Yeah. And what happened to all their furniture and everything? Well, we got the... Yours was okay. The, the, ours was okay. We got the refrigerator, refrigerator that state that was shipped to us in, in uh, Connecticut. Connecticut, and it lasted... So but, we, but what happened to the Japanese families who didn't have a neighbor that stored their... They, they, they lost it. They just lost it. And the churches took them in, but they couldn't do anything about the furniture. The, the secondhand, uh, you know, people came down and they... Picked them all Just up. cleaned out the house. Yeah. Yukon, the state of New Jersey, and and when did you retire, Seth? Well, I retired, um, oh, I don't know, I think about 20 years ago. Yeah. And you were with the state uh, during your whole career in New Jersey. Yes, yes. yes. Yes, I was. Well, wait a minute. That was a private company. You it was with a them, private actually. company, and I became its CEO uh, during that time. Of that company. Of that company. Did you? Yeah. 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 It was. It was nice because uh, we were. We we were appointed uh, as the uh, American. Engineering group in Iceland. Oh, really? Yeah, because we were the uh, U.S. was the representative of of the NATO countries in Iceland, and one of the one of the functions of Iceland was to serve as the starting point for for atomic bombers. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was a very important place. Base, air base. Yeah. So, yeah. so when uh, I when I went there with a group of about ten of our people, uh, we were the eastern anchor of the Dew Line, as you remember. It was Dew Line was was a stretch from Alaska to oh, yeah. Iceland to counteract the uh, uh, expected uh, things from Russia. Oh, yeah, I remember yeah. that. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. you worked on that? Yeah. yeah. Well, we at the end, and uh, when I was there for any of the, the activities and decisions, you know, I worked with our ambassador and there you know, at high level people and uh, it was uh, one of the things was the wife of our ambassador wanted to change the color of the roofs of all <laughs> asked me to help 
Click really? The <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's funny. Uh, well, that's a talking to the ambassador in yeah. Iceland is a long way from an from an internment camp in Arkansas. Yes. Um, the um, when this happened seventy five years ago. Um, what what did your father say? Oh, oh you mean, he, he he said, you know, this country will make good. It it's the kind of country that you cannot that cannot. Uh, Stay your enemy. It will. It will come back and be your, your uh, support. Support. Yeah. They'll make up. They'll make they'll this make, up to us. Yes. Yes. Someday. Yes. That's right. So, I would say, they did a good job. Yeah, I. I mean, uh, look what look where, look what where I got to, what where I, where I made. Uh, one of the things that I give myself credit for, we were an engineering company. We had a. Um, um, Profit sharing fund, and as we retired, you could take the money out of the profit sharing, and you know do, and being engineers, they would all put it into bond funds. Ah, uh. for some reason, I felt perfectly comfortable putting it into what was then called the Magellan Fund. Oh, yeah. Fantastic fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what I have now is mostly due to the Magellan Fund. Is that right? <laughs> is that right? That's, oh. That's great. Yeah. See, even my, even my grandson knows that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He says, he says, yeah, he's he's a good uh, he's a good good investor. Investor, yeah. <laughs> well, I think for your father to, in the face of this this awful act um, of uh, putting you people on encampment, yeah. to say. They'll make it good someday. Yeah. It was pretty remarkable. So thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Thank good. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance to tell a story. It's an important story. Yeah.